Good evening. Good evening. <laughs> I want to welcome everybody to part two of this uh, Sustainable Salmon Rafael and Others event. And hopefully the sound of my voice will carry out into the atrium and coax everyone to come on inside. Jeff, could you coax everybody to come inside, please? Thank you. Um, this is part two of a series that we're calling Hell and High Water, um, Adapting to Climate Change in San Rafael and Marin. Uh, I'm Bill Carney. I'm the president of Sustainable San Rafael. And um, for those of you who missed part one, I'm going to give you a two-sentence uh, summary of it uh, in a few moments. Um, but first, I want to acknowledge uh, our partners in putting this on. Uh, we've teamed up for this event with uh, two other organizations. Uh, the Environmental Forum of Marin, which is the uh, premier educational, uh, environmental educational organization uh, in the county. Um, and they have an ongoing series, we're in the midst of right now, of educational seminars um, uh, available on their website to, so check it out. They have one coming up this Saturday and then um, on through the next month or so. Uh, so highly recommend that. And we're also teamed tonight with Galenus Watershed Council, uh, which in North San Rafael has, in particular, has really been at the forefront of the sea level rise uh, issue. A uh, very hands-on effective group, um, hands-on on Earth Day. You're welcome to come out to Galenus Creek with them and uh, help clean up uh, the creek as a service to start off Earth Day. They also uh, get in the trenches at planning commission meetings uh, around a particular project going on right now involving an uh, area that, that uh, will be flooded uh, over the next century. So um, Galenus Watershed Council. Uh, and then, of course, Sustainable San Rafael, uh, here within this city, about a fifth of the county, uh, works on advocacy and on education uh, on a whole range of sustainability uh, issues, um, including enthusiastic support for an item that's going to be discussed in this room before council uh, this coming Monday which is uh, how do we go about creating really compact, livable, walkable uh, neighborhoods. Uh, and the form that's taking is consideration by our council of uh, the first of two station, smart station area plans uh, that have been percolating through the process for about the last year or so. So uh, very important long-term planning uh, that we're involved in. I would urge, uh, urge all of your involvement. Uh, Sustainable San Rafael is uh, under the umbrella of a countywide group, Sustainable Marin, uh, which has al allies with us on, on many issues of a, of a regional nature. Uh, I also want to recognize that you know, the work of climate change, which is kind of a unifying theme in all of the work that we do, is of course a global uh, issue, and we have global partners in that effort too, and a couple of things coming up uh, of interest. Uh, a week from Friday, a week from tomorrow, at the Rafael Theater will be the premiere of a film called The Island President, uh, focusing on Mohammed Nasheed, um, president of the Maldives, and his efforts to uh, address what three feet of sea level rise, which we're going to be talking about tonight, three feet, not too much, uh, will do in terms of putting his country underwater. Uh, so that film is his whole political struggle, both for democracy and for the planet, very inspiring uh, story. So that's coming our way on 4th Street. Uh, and then on Saturday the 7th, Bill McKibben, the founder of 350.org, which Sustainable Sam Rafael has partnered with on a local level, uh, for the last three or four years, uh, putting together, well, putting local events onto a, a regional framework. Bill McKibben is going to be uh, speaking at the, uh, you know, I'm not going to get it wrong, the UU Church on Franklin Street in San Francisco <laughs> uh, on Saturday morning the 7th. Uh, and there's some material on the back on all of these events and organizations. Uh, so please, I would encourage your, your support of these, uh, these efforts. 
Um, and just a couple of other little things in the way of support. There's always membership for all three organizations, and there is an opportunity on the tables in the back. Uh, if you are interested in signing up for Deep Green uh, Energy through Marin uh, Clean Energy, uh, if you do that now, you can check off Sustainable Marin and help support our efforts uh, because uh, MCE is offering to give nonprofits some money depending on how many people sign up and check off their name. So we've got these in the back, and I would encourage you to uh, check that out. The other thing I wanted to mention in the back is uh, getting back to my two-sentence summary, we have copies of this book, which sold out at our last event. Uh, we had the author of the book. Uh, probably the best book on climate adaptation, at least in the, you know, the big popular press. Uh, it's called Hot by Mark Hertzgard uh, of San Francisco, uh, formerly of uh, Bolinas. Um, so great book um, and would encourage you considering buying it if you really want to get in greater depth into the kind of stuff you're going to be hearing about tonight. So the two sentence um, summary of what Mark said uh, last time, two great quotes really that kind of put bookends on, on the issue of, of climate change. Uh, the first is from Mark, quote, we must manage the unavoidable. And that's really what adaptation is about. That's really what we're talking about tonight. Climate change can no longer be uh, denied. It is uh, happening. We see the effects uh, around us uh, and read about the effects every day in the newspaper, including this morning. Um, so it is happening. The change is inevitable. We're going to see that particularly focused on sea level rise uh, tonight. Um, the impacts are growing. Uh, if we act now, we can reduce the impacts and we can reduce the costs that it's going to take to deal with these things. So acting now, acting soon is really important. Acting together is very important as well. Uh, and that means, you know, as individuals, but it also means as communities, both local jurisdictions and regional, uh, our wider regional communities. So we're going to hear both those perspectives uh, this evening on how to go about adapting to, uh, to climate change. Um, we don't really know at this point, we're very early on in that process, we don't really know what it means to adapt. And what we're really, we're not coming with answers at all, but we are trying to get a conversation going about how can we adapt to these inevitable changes, how can we deal with them. Now the second sentence from Mark uh, is, you know, after we must manage the unavoidable, we must avoid the unmanageable. And that gets in the realm of, of not just dealing with the effects of climate change, but how do we deal with the causes of climate change in order to really get a handle and be able to arrest this. Otherwise, we're going to be building levees. Uh, you know, we're going to be building three feet worth of levees, and we've got a 30-foot problem, right? We're going to be building to the wrong problem. We're going to be solving for the wrong problem. Uh, so we've got to stop the causes of the problem. Interestingly, we kind of know a lot more about, how, about what's involved in that. I mean, it really boils down to a pretty simple thing. Again, twofold, we've got to get off fossil fuels, number one. And number two, we've got to get the rest of the planet off of fossil fuels, right? We've got to take on a major leadership role in marshalling through that transition. Um, we know how to do that. And those of you who have been, you know, coming to, to um, our sessions over the years know sort of the litany of things that can be done both on a community level and on an individual level. Um, we can, you know, get 100% renewable energy from solar and wind or and MCE, et cetera. We can plug in electric vehicles to that energy and transform our transportation system from fossil fuels to clean energy. We have a lot of, you know, age-old traditional approaches to how to weatherize houses, and we've got a lot of newfangled uh, uh, innovations on HVAC, et cetera, of how to move towards zero emission buildings. Uh, and we know a lot about uh, uh, reducing and uh, recycling 
uh, and composting and getting really towards zero waste as well, which is the, the third big contributor to, um, to carbon emissions in uh, our communities. So we sort of, we know, you know, what to do. And we also know on the leadership side that we have one very important tool, one additional very important tool, and that is the ballot box. And in Marin, as a result, we actually do have leaders who are, who hear us and are willing to join this conversation and are willing to actually step forward and begin to provide the leadership that uh, not just Marin, but really the larger uh, world needs on solving this incredibly important crisis of, of climate that's, that's upon us. So um, in the room tonight, we've got probably more of those leaders than I'm going to be able to name. So I'm going to <laughs> stick with uh, Damon Conley. Damon, where are you? There he is. <laughs> Who is a <laughs> my advisor here. <laughs> Thank you, Greg. Uh, Damon is a council person uh, here in these chambers for San Rafael and also the chair of the uh, MC, of MCE, of the Marin Energy uh, Authority. Um, and despite that intervention, I'm not sure I'm going to actually try to bundle my way through others, and I apologize for that. I did want to ask um, our supervisor, uh, Kate Sears, um, to say a few words, because in addition to being uh, on, the, on the Board of Supervisors, she is Marin's uh, representative on the uh, BCDC, on the, the uh, conservation, the Bay San Francisco Bay Conservation and Development Commission, um, and thus has a really prime role in the leadership on these issues regionally. So, Kate, would you like to say a few words? Thank you, thank you Bill. So, I, I got onto BCDC right towards the tail end of the preparation of the Bay Plan amendments to deal with sea level rise. And it, it really has been a fascinating uh, process, and I know many of you in this room were very intimately involved in making sure that those amendments said what they should say in very important ways for our environment. But, you know, this regional planning process to deal with sea level rise is going to be a challenge if you think of trying to get all of our communities around the Bay to come up with a plan that will work to some degree in all of our communities. And I think, you know, BCDC has played a very important role in being at the forefront of, of starting this planning process and will continue to be involved. But one of the things that really struck me uh, in that process was not only the importance of regional thinking, but it was really the importance of local thinking. And so I really feel very strongly about the importance of all of us having this conversation at our local levels about how we are going to address sea level rise and what our values are and what our priorities are. One of the challenges in having that conversation is trying to get our arms around all of the information that's out there and to take best, uh, make best use and take the best advantage of the work that BCDC has done, but then really uh, also take advantage of the other work that's being done at, at a broader uh, regional level above BCDC and in some of our other communities around California and in other states. And so to make that step forward and to try to get the information we need to inform our local conversations, I think a really important first step is to have Joe LeClaire and our other members of our panel here to talk to us about the regional perspective. And so I'm really pleased to be here for your panel. And uh, then I want to see all of us keep our local conversations going and move forward, hopefully with Joe's and others' continued involvement. So thank you. Look forward to it. Thank you, Kate. Okay, so now I'm going to turn it over to the uh, chair of Sustainable San Rafael's Climate Adaptation Working Group, which uh, you'll hear a little bit more about uh, at the end of the evening, Gail Nappel. Um, Gail, uh, Gail's day job involves getting on the ferry and going across the bay every day uh, and working at Ginsler Architects, which is one of the biggest architectural firms in the world, uh, where she has taking a, taken a, a leading role in working with her colleagues and, and her clients in addressing um, adaptation, climate adaptation issues. So Gail, take it away. Thank you. And I will introduce our panel. 
But I have to put this here because I'm not used to microphones. So. And tell me if you can't hear me. I'm going to introduce all of our speakers first. And um, these three people were hand-picked and hand-urged to come speak to us about local adaptations to global climate change um, and focusing on sea level rise. Two of them I've been talking to for maybe a year or more about trying to put this event together. Not their fault. It just took us a while to get our act together. Um, and I'll tell you who they are in the order that they're speaking, and then they will do, be doing a little bit of dancing back and forth to do some of their presentations. Um, Jeremy Lowe is with ESA PWA, which is an environmental planning company. He is their sea level rise program manager and a coastal geomorphologist. He has over 24 years of experience in coastal and estuary projects, the last 11 years of which have been in the Bay Area and West Coast. He's an experienced manager of wetland restoration projects like the Salt Pond Restoration in South San Francisco Bay and Bologna Wetlands in LA. He also led the development of tidal wetland restoration guidelines for San Francisco Bay, for Puget Sound, and for the Lower Columbia River. His work on sea level rise and climate change adaptation includes vulnerability assessment, adaptation strategies, and management of uncertainty using his knowledge of natural ecosystem processes to develop resilient shorelines. Paul Jensen is our local expert. He is our city's community development director and a true local. He's been living and working in San Rafael for over 33 years. He actually started in San Rafael as a planner 33 years ago and then had his own environmental planning consultant group for um, almost uh, the interim, well, up until four years ago when he came back here full time to work for us. And he was promoted to director when Bob Brown retired about a year ago. And climate change, um, what he said, I'm interested in learning as much as possible. So he's joined some of the rest of us and not necessarily being an expert yet. And Joe LeClaire is the Chief Planning Officer for BCDC, the San Francisco Bay Conservation and Development Commission. He plans, directs, and supervises the Commission's planning program, serves as technical advisor, and is liaison with governmental and private agencies on planning matters. He has a BA in economics and an MA in landscape architecture and city and regional planning. I love it when people have the economic uh, aspect of all this. And uh, his, um, his MA is from our mutual alma mater, UC Berkeley. He developed Mountain View's Urban Forest Preservation Program, has presented papers on shoreline public access issues at professional conferences. He seems to be doing a lot of that. And is on the board of directors for the Bay Trails Project. So Jeremy will speak first. Well, thank you. Um, as, uh, as Gail said, I'm a coastal geomorphologist. And coastal is pretty obvious, because that's by the sea and in estuaries and so on. But geomorphology, geo is the study of the earth, and morphology is the study of the shape of the earth. And so I look at beaches and estuaries, and I think about how, they're going to, how they've evolved in the past and how they're going to change into the future. And I did a lot of work on wetland restoration. I worked on the Hamilton Airfield restoration on the South Bay salt ponds and Napa salt ponds. Um, and that, that was a lot of money spent on doing restoration and re improving the ecology of the, of the area. And then uh, I, I obviously come from Europe, where we had sea level rise a long time ago. And coming here, it was, in, it was found about two or three years ago, we found out that we had sea level rise as well. And people started asking, what's going to happen to these wetland restorations? So this is why I'm going to sort of get involved. Uh, a typical bay, bay shoreline we have here, this is actually on the East Bay, and I'll be talking about this later on. Um, at Hayward, but we have a very low-lying um, flat areas surrounding the bay, and the bay has been pretty stable for the last 3,000 years or so. So we got used to building and, and, and living next to a static bay. But things are going to change. Uh, we have uh, climate change coming, often called global warming, and that's only one aspect of it. Um, there's going to be a whole lot of changes, and we're going to focus on sea level rise and oceans at the moment. Um, when we when we have uh, sea level rise, we've got two things happening. One is the, the, the water moving up and down, and then we've got the vertical land motion of the, uh, of, of the land moving up and down as well. We have earthquakes and so on, a lot of movement. So the, the, the relationship with those two is going to influence how we live and work around the bay. And what influences the, the, the water level is going to be things like just warming up. When you warm up water, it expands, so it gets, it gets higher. Uh, we're going to change the relationship between how much is stored in ice and how much is in the ocean. Some of the ice sites are going to melt. And we're also going to have some big changes when some of those ice sheets uh, move from the land 
onto the, into the ocean. And that's one of the big problematical areas uh, that we're going to have to face. It's just like being in a cocktail bar and somebody coming along with an ice cube. You can leave it on the bar and watch it melt slowly, or you can get the, get the, um, the ice cube, you can drop it in your drink, and suddenly the water level goes up really quickly. So we're going to have to deal with sort of both those types of issues. And there's lots of uncertainties. We're not so sure what's going to happen. But as, uh, as was pointed out earlier, the main driver of this is temperature. main driver of the temperature is the, the emissions that we have. And, and ultimately, in the longer term, it's the mitigation that's going to, going to work for us. Here we've got a, a, just a diagram, one of the very few graphs we're going to have tonight, which shows, interestingly, on the bottom scale, on the X scale, goes from, from today up to 1,000 years into the future. So that's, you know, we're talking about long-term things. And here we've just got a, a blip hoping that we're going to reduce our carbon emissions. So this is a, a diagram showing our carbon emissions dropping off as our mitigation uh, not, um, comes into play. So what would happen to carbon dioxide? We'll hope, we, we hope it levels off. Leveling off means the temperature is going to stay hopefully leveled off as well. So those types of impacts, we, we think we can, we, if, we, if we manage our emissions, we can, we can manage. What's going to happen to the sea level rise, though? Well, if we just inc if it was just based upon the amount of temperature of the, the oceans, the amount of expansion, then that should level off as well. But as I said, ice does differently. We, we start melting it, it's going to continue to melt, even if we stabilize the temperature. And unfortunately, in terms of sea level rise, the projections are that sea level rise is going to continue to change, increase, not just this century, but in centuries to come. And so when we're talking about adaptation, we need to bear that in mind. Often, we're only doing interim work while we're thinking of some bigger changes we might have to do into the future. There are lots of different uncertainties about this. We have never managed the Earth, or we haven't had experienced the Earth, when the temperature has been rising quite so rapidly. And there are lots of concerns about changes in the permafrost, changes in the ocean circulations, the El Ninos, the Atlantic circulations, what's going to happen to the monsoons. These are lots of uncertainties. So when we talk about predictions, it's not predictions in the, this is definitely going to happen. It's more like projections. If we emit in certain ways, we think this might happen, but we don't know. So adaptation also includes ma managing uncertainty and how we're going to manage that uncertainty. So this is just a quick uh, graph which shows what's happened in the past in San Francisco. The squiggly line is the recorded uh, tide level, uh, sea level from 1890 to 2010. And then we have a series of lines going off with 5, 19, 40. That's the number of inches we're expecting by 2100. So you can see the historic rate was about 5 inches. In the future, uh, the IPCC said 2007 said 19 inches by 2100. They ignored it, the glacial melt. So then uh, the Coastal Conservancy and the state now talk about 40, 55 inches. And now the Corps of Engineers, the federal government, is talking about 58 inches. So these are large amounts of sea level rise. To give you perspective, and I see my time is nearly up, I'm going to now, at personal risk, show you what this sea level rise will look like. Here I am, standing by the edge of the shoreline in the year 2000. By 2050, around the bay, we're expecting to see 14 inches of sea level rise. That, so all our levees, all our stormwater sewers and so on have to cope with 14 inches. By 2100, it's going to be up to my chest. And as I said, it's going to continue. So <laughs> our, challenge, our challenge is how do we adapt to that amount of sea level rise and yet maintain our, our cities and our economic viabilities. Thank you. tonight. Uh, this is the first time I've ever spoken in front of a crowd of uh, sustainable San Rafael folks, and I'm very happy to be here. I've, I've come to this uh, council chambers probably several hundred times in my career, but never before this group. So again, I'm happy to be here. And I um, actually was a little surprised when Bill Carney contacted me to participate this evening, because um, I know very little about 
sea level rise. And I kept thinking, what can I offer this group? I, I really don't know too much about it. And I come to find out from colleagues, both engineering and planning colleagues, uh, very few know little about sea level rise. But what I can offer is my knowledge of the community and to give you some ideas on some uh, local conditions and uh, a bit of a road map for where we need to go. One of my passions is historic aerial photos. I hope you find this interesting. This is a, an aerial photo of San Rafael in 1953. And this is uh, looking northwestward from uh, what you see in the foreground here, which is called uh, San Quentin or Bartell Ridge. This line here is now I-580. This is 101. You can see the shoreline comes well into um, uh, in, into an area which is now all of East San Rafael. This is Spinnaker Point. And I, you really don't need to be a brain surgeon to figure out that when you look at the sea level rise maps, it, they pretty much return to what you see here, if not more. So where do we start? Uh, most of you are familiar with the BCDC maps that have been uh, published and were published in 2007. And up until this point, um, they've always been published with this disclosure for information purposes only. Uh, so we don't use them for, um, uh, in the uh, true sense for planning, but it's a good uh, starting point. And there are three areas of focus in San Rafael when we look at these maps. You will find uh, this is uh, uh, the BCDC map for, I believe, a prediction for 2100. And there are three areas. Uh, the lowest area is central San Rafael. In fact, I'm going to take this out here. This is a little more comfortable. Central San Rafael, you will see this whole blue area, which le uh, uh, sea level rise is predicted to go well into downtown San Rafael. The second area is the Peacock Gap, San Pedro Peninsula region. And then this area here is the Galinas Basin. So what has San Rafael addressed to date? Many of you are aware of the fact and participated in the Climate Change Action Plan that was adopted in 2009. Uh, my uh, former boss, Bob Brown, was, uh, led that effort. And he also led the effort in taking that Climate Change Action Plan and actually folding it into our general plan last year in 2011. And both of these documents include policies and programs addressing sea level rise. The adopted programs that we have uh, include assessing a levy system, inventorying these levees and their heights, and testing them over the time. And this is both for public and private levees. Ultimately installing monitoring gauges and then coordinating with BCDC to monitor and plan for shoreline defense. And of course, we have BCDC here this evening to report on the status of that. So to start assessing levies, where do we start? Uh, we have not started. And uh, this is, this is a, a public works task because it's an engineering uh, function. And it requires funding, and it also requires being uh, placed on the city's capital improvement program. This effort is not exclusive to San Rafael. It's a multi-agency effort throughout the county, and not only involves the county, but BCDC, the US Army Corps of Engineers, and FEMA. In terms of uh, San Rafael's levees and shorelines, I'd like to cover three areas of the city that require attention as part of this effort. The first is the Inner Canal and East San Rafael shoreline. The Inner Canal, of course, is the San Rafael Creek that leads up to um, the Grand Avenue Bridge and, and further inland and influences um, downtown. Uh, East San Rafael shoreline is mostly uh, the area in the southeast portion of San Rafael. The San Pedro Peninsula, which includes Loch Lomond and Peacock Gap, and then lastly, the uh, Galinas Creek Basin. And to start with the Inner Canal, this is primarily the San Rafael Canal. And uh, this is an interesting area because it has a combination of developed conditions. Uh, first, as, and this is a shot that was taken from the uh, Grand Avenue Bridge, 
what you have is a lot of uh, building and construction interface directly with water. So you have buildings that are either built over the water or have small seawalls or uh, levees uh, that um, provide some level of protection under existing conditions for properties. Also along the inner canal, we have residential neighborhoods, some of which are built at close to sea level. Uh, this is a, a road that's just um, this area here, oh, excuse me. This area here to the left is part of the San Rafael Canal, and this, this is Lowry's Marina. Mooring Road is a residential road just uh, east of uh, the Montecito Shopping Center, and it's built close to sea level. As you can see, there's no levee for protection, and the elevation change from this point to the water is, is uh, not that much <laughs> vertically. So the, this area does experience some flooding, and... Um, and uh, in, in high tide conditions. And so this is one of the areas that's gonna have to be looked at. Another area moving further east is, an, is a subdivision called Marina Vista. And this is uh, Summit Road, um, Seaway, just shy of uh, the Sea Strand area and the, uh, around the Marin Yacht Club. What's interesting about this area is, again, it's a series of lots built close to sea level, and as you can see, this is wetland that borders a uh, small estuary portion of the San Rafael Canal, and then it leads up to a developed area, and most of the homes are built at this elevation here, so it's, again, very close to sea level, no protection. So now to concentrate a bit on the East San Rafael shoreline, um, this is the area outside the mouth of the San Rafael Creek and pretty much extends uh, southward toward the Richmond San Rafael Bridge. What we have is a, the Spinnaker Point uh, levee. Uh, this is a levee that uh, protects the Spinnaker Point and the Bay Point Lagoon neighborhoods. This levee was built, I believe, in the 1970s, and during that time, it was considered state-of-the-art. And in fact, if you can see uh, the elevation of, if I can get this here to work, the elevation down, it, of the residential development is below the crown of the levee. And um, up until recently, FEMA identified this neighborhood exclusively compared to the rest of East San Rafael in a 500-year flood a plane, and it's now been reclassified in a 100-year floodplain. So it's more vulnerable to, uh, to sea level rise conditions. So this levee will obviously have to be studied to see uh, what can be done. And that, uh, that among uh, other things, creates challenges where you have uh, levees that are next to residential development. Canalways. Canalways is a large parcel of land that's located between Spinnaker Point and what is the Shoreline Center, uh, where uh, Home Depot is, is located. And this is a stretch of levee that is probably has the lowest elevation in East San Rafael. It's not, it, it right now does not even um, uh, cover flood control standards. And uh, it historically, uh, during high tides, the water has overflowed into the canal ways property. So this is a, a very important piece of the East San Rafael area that will have to be studied carefully. This is another uh, photograph of uh, the shoreline levee. And if, if, if any of you have taken the hike along the shoreline, this is the portion that's, that, uh, that breaks off from Spinnaker Point, and the elevation drops dramatically. You could see the, the, the actual change in elevation. And then moving southward, the, um, the shoreline path and levee continue. Uh, this is a shot of the shoreline center. Now, I took this photograph primarily because what's interesting about the shoreline center is that it is a closed landfill. The elevation of the shoreline center is close to 27 or 28 feet above sea level. So if you look at the BCDC sea level prediction maps, this is the one area that's not blue. And so um, you, can, you can see the apparent change in elevation. Nonetheless, this will have to be reviewed 
ultimately when um, the levees are reviewed. And then moving further south, this is Piombo Place, almost near the terminus of the, the Shoreline Park. Uh, this stretch of levee was built um, in the 1960s and then uh, was finished off with the Shoreline Path in the 1980s. Moving on to the San Pedro Peninsula, there are a couple of areas that require um, some attention for study. Uh, the first is the Loch Lomond Marina. Um, th they have done some protective measures here. There's, of course, a, um, a breakwater that uh, separates the marina from the bay that would not accommodate rise in sea level, but there are other portions of the site um, that have been, um, uh, there have been some adaptive measures, but it is also an area vulnerable to sea, uh, sea level rise. And then moving further east, the Glenwood and Peacock Gap uh, seawall. I don't know if any of you are familiar with this area or live out in this area, but during high tides and heavy rains, it's not unusual to see water come over that levee and go on to Point San Pedro Road. And then lastly, I want to cover the Galenas Basin. There are a couple of areas. Um, this area is more protected from the bay, yet because of the elevations, it has an equal amount of potential for rise in sea level according to the prediction maps. Of course, we have the McGinnis Park and San Rafael Airport. There is a levee that borders the airport, and it's roughly been seen in this area here that, of course, would have to be studied along with um, uh, the conditions along the, the, the public park side. Marin Lagoon, uh, this is a neighborhood that is just east of Autodesk. It was built in the 1980s. There is no levee protection, but there is a transition from the, um, from the development toward the uh, Galenas Marsh area and Galenas Creek. Contempo Marin. Contempo Marin has no protection. They have a, uh, um, there is a, a very small levee that borders um, this development, but uh, it is vulnerable and it's immediately adjacent to uh, the Galenas Marsh and Creek. So what is happening now? I'd like to report, I, I um, had several meetings with our public works department because they're, they're, on the, they're in the lead on, on the next steps in this process. And what they've reported to me is that FEMA flood maps are being updated and they're expected to be published this spring. The FEMA maps will consider some sea level rise conditions and will also present some changes in federal requirements for levee heights and building protection. What, what this means is that le uh, FEMA sets a standard by which you must build above a certain elevation, and that means that the elevation of that standard is going to, to increase. So we're waiting for those, those maps to be published. What is also happening, as BCDC will report, is that there's an education and collaboration with the local agencies. There's also the North Bay Watershed Association that's been formed. And the primary purpose is to develop adaptive measures for levee design and type based on the various conditions in the community. And then also buffer requirements and standards. And these would be, for example, uh, a sea, let's say a sea level setback or some sort of requirement to restore an area uh, to accommodate additional um, water. At the city of San Rafael level, uh, as I mentioned, the Public Works Department takes the lead on levy assessment. This requires a lot of money and budgeting. So we're at the, the formative stages here. It also has to be reviewed and prioritized uh, and placed on the city's capital improvement program. And then lastly, requires coordination with the county and other local uh, public works department agencies in the county. There are some study challenges. First of all, it cannot be piecemealed, meaning that um, we have to look at a larger area. We can't study this on a site-by-site -site basis. We also need an area-wide study to be able to provide a nexus for solutions. 
Important thing, there are environmental considerations. You create a levee or you, uh, let's say, uh, breach an area to allow for, uh, for inundation to accommodate additional rise in sea level. You have to study hydrology to make sure that the uh, hydrology works. There are biological impacts from converting, let's say, seasonal wetland to an area that may be submerged entirely. entirely. And then visual impacts. You may recall the, the photograph of the, um, the Spinnaker Point levee. Once you raise a levee, you cut off views. People are not going to be happy if they bought a house to look out onto the bay that they may not be able to, uh, to have that view. And then lastly, there are legal considerations, property rights. Obviously, a lot of the shoreline in Marin is privately owned, and that has to be considered uh, in studying this and creating solutions. So what can't we do at this time? We can't reclaim or condemn, condemn developed land that's a taking, and we cannot require mitigation or measures on individual sites without the completion of a larger study. But what we can do is prioritize and fund and have the staff available to study uh, this, um, this topic area. Also encourage property owners to participate and address. And I put up here an example. The village at Loch Lomond Marina project was approved about five years ago. I showed you a slide of the shoreline. Uh, that project developer chose to add an extra foot and a half of elevation on that site to accommodate for what we knew at that time might be able to address sea level rise. That was a voluntary effort by the developer. We could not require that as a city. So that's something uh, to, as an example, to encourage property owners to do. Also to minimize new runoff. We have uh, uh, runoff uh, policies right now that's, that essentially say that if you develop land and you add runoff, you must capture it on site so that you, uh, there's no net increase in runoff from, from your property or development. And then lastly, identify some opportunity areas for adaptive measures. And that's what I'd like to cover next is, are there possible opportunity areas, public and private lands, that should be studied for either new or improved levees or buffers and setbacks for water storage and other adaptive measures? I do want to qualify the photographs that I'm going to show you are a combination of public and private lands. Um, we don't know at this time if they're suitable for adaptive measures or even available, of course, but they are areas that should be studied as part of this greater effort. One of the areas is an area called the Sea Strand Open Space, and this is public open space that is uh, uh, directly adjacent to the San Rafael Canal. And this includes a combination of wetland areas and also upland areas that might be uh, some area that, that could be reclaimed and or at least provide some adaptive measures. Another area is San Pedro Cove open space. This is a privately owned open space land that's upland, again, next to the bay. Uh, it, it could provide some opportunities for adaptive measures. Dutra Quarry. Now, this is outside the city limits, but um, there's large areas of this land uh, that are now seasonal wetland. In fact, all of this area here, which is, I would say, it, uh, it's the large area between Peacock Gap and the actual quarry operation, that might be an opportunity area for study. Canalways is another site. This is 85 acres. I mentioned it early, at, earlier. Uh, the elevation of the site is close to, if not portions of it, are below sea level. Uh, and it's immediately adjacent to Bay, and it's probably the largest undeveloped site in the East San Rafael area. And here's another shot of Canalways looking uh, southwest. McGinnis Park and San Rafael Airport. Now, as you all, many of you know, we have a project that uh, is being proposed at the airport, but there are a great amount of, there's a great amount of land area that abut, abuts the San Rafael Creek that's not even proposed for development. So these are some areas that um, might be uh, uh, good opportunity areas to study for adaptive measures along with the McGinnis Park. 
Now, I want to give you some examples of what private property owners have done. And while I was out taking these photographs, I discovered some very interesting things that I thought I'd share with you. Um, I mentioned the Marina Vista subdivision. This is an area that's um, in the Inner Canal area on Summit Avenue. This property owner chose to build a seawall uh, to protect their property. And so this is probably what you're going to see in terms of private improvements and possibly a, an example of a, what could be a public improvement al along certain areas. Now, I doubt very much this would accommodate the predictions in, in sea level rise, but it gives you an idea of what's been done at a private property level. This was installed not too long ago. This is just um, east of the um, Grand Avenue Bridge. In fact, the building that you see here is the backside of Montecito Shopping Center. This is a parking lot, a used car lot. They put in this, this uh, essentially this large bulkhead a couple of years ago, and that's a pretty, that's a pretty tall improvement. So I imagine um, this is a type of thing that you may see as well uh, for adaptive measures on private property. So that concludes my presentation. Thank you. My name is Joe LeClaire. I'm with BCDC Chief Planning Officer, and it's really a delight to be here tonight. You're really lucky to have somebody like Paul in San Rafael who's taking this issue seriously and going out and taking a look at the community and on the ground looking at what the opportunities are for addressing uh, sea level rise because um, many communities are, I would say, uh, quite a bit further behind the eight ball than, um, than San Rafael is in, in you know, starting to grapple with this issue. Um, but um, what I'll explain to you tonight is work that we've done at BCDC on um, updating the Bay Plan that the Commission uses to evaluate permits, and then a planning process that we have underway with um, in, in Alameda County. Let's see. Point it at the screen, point it Pointed at my head. Um, let's see. Use the forward here. This one. Oh, that would help. So I was using the backward one. Aha! Operator error as usual. Um, so the commission uses the Bay Plan to evaluate project proposals like the Loch Lomond Marina, which we evaluated for sea level rise when it came in for a permit. And the commission was directed by the legislature in 65 to prepare a plan for San Francisco Bay for managing the bay as a resource and, and allowing wise development of the bay and the shoreline. And the, the legislature also directed the commission to keep the plan up to date. And so um, we have, over the time, made changes to the plan to address emerging issues. Well, sea level rise emerged as an issue for BCDC first back in 1989. Uh, we worked with consultants and some funding from EPA and NOAA to develop uh, sea level rise policies in the Bay Plan um, that, quite frankly, we never enforced because there really wasn't the uh, scientific context that exists today for um, having a, a real relevant discussion about, about how to go about implementing um, uh, sea level rise policies because at the time the projections for sea level rise well maybe it'll be three feet in a hundred years but nobody's sure and there weren't that many scientific articles to back it up so um, over time they were used to comment on um, environmental documents but not um, not enforced well as the IPCC emerged as a as a credible voice on the importance of addressing sea level rise we recognized that it was important to take stock of the policies in the plan and update them. And um, so, as in order to do that, Jeremy outlined the science that underlies uh, sea level rise, and um, we used that science to conduct a regional vulnerability assessment looking at um, Paul showed some of the maps that, that we use to um, evaluate what, where sea level may go. And this informed the policies that we developed. And the policies that we developed encourage a variety of development um, around, the, around the shoreline that, that has regional benefits, provided that these developments can address you know, the risks of sea level rise. And, um, 
We committed to continue to evaluate projects on a case-by-case -case basis and evaluate each project on its merits and, um, and to determine the, if the benefits of the project outweigh the risks of flooding from sea level rise and to ensure that steps are taken to address sea level rise in the event that the project would be affected by it. Um, and for large projects in the Commission's jurisdiction, the policies require that um, the project be designed to meet a mid-century sea level rise projection. We did not establish numbers and say you have to design to this number, but um, the policies require that the project proponent come in with a, a recommendation as to what they think a credible sea level rise projection is for that project and then um, and demonstrate that they can design to a mid-level or I'm sorry mid-century sea level rise uh, condition and have an adaptive strategy for the next 50 years so for a hundred year period they would be able to adapt the project over time uh, to uh, to sea level rise and that includes having a financing strategy in place to deal with it um, and so the Commission also committed itself to working on a regional level to uh, develop a, a sea level rise strategy uh, for the region. And um, so that means we would work with environmentalists, local government officials, federal agencies, um, insurers, those in the business community and developers to develop a strategy that can ad address the impacts of climate change on a, and sea level rise on a regional scale and that's coordinated with our efforts to address greenhouse gas emissions because although we definitely need to um, address these impacts, we need to look for multi-objective solutions. Um, now, other policies that the Commission adopted um, included um, allowing fill in the bay for shoreline protection for existing development. Now, that's somewhat controversial. But on the other hand, we recognize that there's tremendous value um, in the um, in the developed shoreline, and that there is going to be need some need for fill in some locations uh, to protect existing development from flooding. And we also required that um, any public access that's provided as part of a project remain viable for the life of the project. So, in looking at the Loch Lomond Marina, it was one of our, it was a, actually a good test case for us to examine how we should approach this issue um, and working with the developers as Paul pointed out we identified the low-lying areas on the site looked at where sea level may go in the event that it rose 16 inches 55 inches and settled on a, um, a requirement on our permit that said at least in the public access areas they needed to um, fill them to a point and and come back and retrofit them in the future if need be because of flooding and the uh, so the finished floor heights of buildings and the flooding issues are pertinent to um, uh, development of residential and commercial uses those are the province of local government that's not something we BCDC have control over so we can condition projects like that to ensure the public access is viable, um, but local government has to uh, step in and address the, the flooding issues. And finally, we required that uh, tidal marsh projects have uh, a strategy to address sea level rise and that they make provision for upland migration of the wetlands where possible. Um, that's not always possible because we've often built right down to the shoreline in many cases um, but and also to provide for a buffer for transitional habitat now what I'd like to do is talk about so those were the policies that we developed I'd like to shift over and talk about a planning project that we're undertaking in Alameda County it's called the adapting to rising tides project or the art project and we're conduct BCDC's leading this project in partnership with a, a wide variety of partners and it's our first effort um, to begin exploring how we develop regional policy um, that addresses the, the future beyond um, what we could accomplish in the, up, the update that I just described. And um, 
So the Adapting to Rising Tides project is a collaborative effort uh, that's being led by the Commission to help better understand how sea level rise and storm events will affect the future of our shoreline and how we can begin to address the challenges. Um, and to answer these questions, the ART project is engaging a number of partners and stakeholders um, in an adaptive plan uh, adaptation planning process that will result in tangible recommendations for how communities uh, can address these impacts. So, um, what we're using in the ART project is a planning process that was developed by ICLE, a uh, nonprofit organization that um, has been studying this climate change issue for quite some time. And um, it has four major steps to it. So the first is to scope and organize. And that means getting your, your experts and your information in order so that you can actually begin to plan. And it's a, it's one of the things that we've learned about this as we've dove into it is that this is a, a, a kind of a nuts and bolts planning process. It's not unique, it's not new, and it's something that we have the capability to do. Um, it's, it, we've done it in the past with other issues and we can certainly do it with this one. Um, and once we have the information that we need, then we have to assess what are the existing conditions on the ground and looking at um, a better understanding of what the impacts might be, um, and, and conducting a vulnerability assessment and, and assessing the risks and, and, prioritize and, and um, prioritizing the issues and, and the interventions that need to be taken. And th all those uh, get codified in a plan. And then finally, we have to implement and monitor the, one of the things that's different about adaptation planning from uh, planning in the past, it's not a plan that you put on the shelf, but um, has to be monitored and modified based on what we learn from our observations. So it's, uh, it, we're gonna be using more of an adaptive management approach going forward so that we can revise our um, strategies based on what we observe over time in the way of change. So what we did to solicit interest around the um, region was to announce the art project and we got several um, uh, counties put together proposals that we considered and we were looking for both capacity and interest the willingness of the partners to work with us, uh, diversity of shoreline types and land uses, and regionally significant transportation infrastructure because we had funding from the FHWA, believe it or not, um, that we were able to use to conduct the shoreline assessment. And it was important that we have significant transportation infrastructure as, as part of the study area. And so we selected, after considering proposals from, including Marin County, um, several several counties in the region, the area from Emeryville down to Union City, so kind of bracketed by the Bay Bridge and the, um, and the San Mateo Bridge. And um, so the, um, we often say that the art project is kind of like, it looks a little bit like a NASCAR logo because there's so many project partners involved. But we, um, so BCDC is leading the project, but there was a first phase that focused on the transportation uh, an analysis and the shoreline assessment analysis that we did in close partnership with MTC and Caltrans. Um, and, but we also have a lot of participation from the, um, from MTC, from FHWA, and, and from ICLE on, on this project. And without those partners, we wouldn't be able to move forward. And um, we also have a number of local partners who are uh, part of the art project team. Um, and so we've convened a working group of representatives from public agencies and private interests with investments along the shoreline. Um, the working group also consists of local county regional, state, and federal partners um, that provide key feedback at points along the way. And you can see here that we've got the cities, we've got the um, BART and um, the Flood Control District, Port of Oakland, and um, Hayward Area Recreation District, so uh, East Bay Regional Park District. So a real broad cross-section of partners, and we have two working groups um, within the uh, ART project, a, a, a 
working group that we work closely with. It's sort of the uh, communications working group, and then uh, um, we present on sort of a quarterly basis to to the staffs of the of the agencies to advise them of our progress. And we're looking at. 12 asset categories within the community. So you can see here, we're looking at the airport, the Oakland International Airport, and uh, community land use, so neighborhoods and shopping centers and so on, contaminated lands, um, hazard uh, energy, pipelines and telecom, hazardous material sites, ground transportation, um, everything from freeways to bike lanes, um, and uh, parks and recreation, natural shorelines. We're looking at the wetlands to see how viable they are going to be uh, over time vis-a-vis uh, -vis sea level rise. The seaport, the Port of Oakland, fifth busiest port on the uh, in the United States. Stormwater and um, structural shoreline. Um, and so as Paul was pointing out, you know, we're looking at the uh, shoreline protection structures to see how viable they are going forward, and wastewater. So these are the sectors that we've decided to analyze um, in the art project. And um, we also, as, as part of the funding that we got from FHWA, we're, be able to, we we're able to do more refined sea level rise maps. And first of all, due to funding from NOAA and USGS, we were able to have better what's called LIDAR, and I don't know what it stands for, it's light something but basically what it does is produce a, um, a very detailed digital map of the of the ground plane that you can then use with hydro models to um, project the water over the landform and um, develop a fairly accurate depiction of inundation projected inundation with different uh, sea level rise uh, values and one of the things that we were able to do that we weren't able to do in the earlier mapping the BCDC did in, in this effort was to show areas that are hydrologically disconnected at, um, at varying levels of sea level rise. So you see the green areas on the map on the right. Um, those are areas that are low-lying. They're potentially vulnerable to sea level rise, but they're protected by a berm or a levee or seawall or some other kind of structure that prevents the tide at a 16 inch sea level rise from reaching those areas. So we think that, although it's uh, one of the criticisms that we heard a lot from the maps that we uh, produced earlier for, this, for the regional study, was that they failed to take shoreline protection into account. Um, and that was a, a, a limitation that we, Paul pointed out, that we had a number of caveats on our maps. Well, it's very important that those are there so that we don't overstate the problem or people don't overinterpret the maps. Um, and in this instance, we were able to identify, you know, those areas at varying levels of sea level rise that are disconnected and not affected. But then you see the adjoining map below where when sea level rise gets to 55 inches, um, the, say the, those green areas start to be affected by sea level rise. Um, but also, um, this analysis enabled us to look at depth and, and which enabled us to better understand what the potential impacts were in given areas because we didn't have depth information before. So the mapping effort was really, really helpful. And um, you can see the potential impacts of uh, frequent or per permanent inundation, uh, more frequent floods. As you know, some people say, the uh, a euphemism for this is that, you know, today's 100-year uh, flood event is tomorrow's high tide, um, and and uh, overtopping of shoreline protection, and and that can have erosive effects as well as you know elevated groundwater and salinity intrusion. Uh, landfills are something that we're not sure what the overall, uh, over the long term, what rising groundwater is going to mean for the landfills that we built around the bay. Um, so using the maps, we're able to do an impact assessment. And um, also, we've prepared an existing conditions and stressors report that outlines what are existing um, challenges that a given asset may face. Maybe it's underfunded, maybe it's old, maybe it needs to be replaced next year. So if that asset is already under stress from whatever the conditions may be, um, then you impose sea level rise on top of that. It may not be as resilient as something that was built last week and is more robust and has some of these um, maybe more modern um, 
uh, in uh, features that would enable it to withstand sea level rise better. So with, you need to formulate that kind of information in order to be able to do a vulnerability assessment based on the impacts. So once you've compiled your impact assessment, you're able to conduct a vulnerability assessment that looks at the exposure. What, will the asset be exposed to sea level rise? And if so, at what depths? And, and, and for what duration? How sensitive is the, um, is the asset to those kind of impacts? Is it built to withstand sea level rise, regular inundation, or not? If it's a home with sheetrock on the ground floor um, and carpet and so on, probably not. You know, it will, one flood and, and the whole thing has to be um, changed out. So that asset would be very sensitive by comparison to one that um, maybe is built to withstand those kind of effects. Maybe the living areas are built, uh, you know, one floor above uh, the flood zone. And then uh, adaptive capacity. How quickly can the asset be brought back online with a minimum of investment or repair? So if, it, if it's going to require like a house where you have to go in and gut everything and clean it out and rebuild, versus maybe you just have to put the door back on the hinge and or um, you know sweep the mud out of the uh, of the the driveway area um, then then you have okay I, I see I'm getting the hook here um, so I'll just speed through these last two slides and point out that your vulnerability you know really is a function of how the how you value these different um, uh, measures of exposure and adaptive capacity and sensitivity and, and you'll have greater or lesser vulnerability. And once you have that information, you can conduct a risk assessment that um, basically helps you set priorities. How, once you know what the impacts are, you go through the risk assessment to say, well, how likely is this to happen? What are the consequences of it? And what does it mean to us as a community? And what should we do about it? And, um, and that's essentially what we're in the process of doing with the art project. Um, we're doing it in two ways. We're doing a desktop analysis as planners, gathering all the information and conducting our own analysis. And then we're doing a survey of the experts in the community and asking them to fill out a questionnaire that, that covers these uh, risks and issues and, and exposures and, and vulnerabilities and asks them what their professional opinion is. And we will feed these two together to develop our vulnerability assessment and ultimately adaptation strategies. And um, so those are the next steps and um, I'll accede my time here because I've already gone over and I thank you for your attention. Well, thank you, um, Joe. And uh, Joe's really set us up for the, ne the last last talk here which is now focused in on one section of the shoreline it's on the east bay around hayward where they've actually done a study of the vulnerability they've done a study of the adaptation strategies and so far a lot of it we've heard is doom and gloom isn't it it's uh, sea levels are going to rise we're all going to get wet not nothing's going to work it's going to cost us a huge amount of money so what are we going to do so hopefully this might be a little bit of a glimmer of hope that there are some other benefits we can get out of this if I use this the right way around. So this is the Hayward shoreline. It's a typical piece of the, of the bay. It's got a mud flat in front of it. They, it's lost its salt marsh. We build on top of the salt marsh. We have a sort of a levee that was thrown up over the years and has been built and changed. Behind that, that's protecting some, uh, some old salt ponds, but there's also a landfills. There's a water treatment facility there. All sorts of the typical things you find around the bay, including a landfill. So. That's, that's the issue. What is going to happen here? Well, now we talked about sea level rise and the, and the, the water just rising up gradually. And that sounds a very benign type of uh, environment. But in fact, what we're really, pro the real problems we're going to face in, uh, soon are the problems of storms, of the extreme events that's happened when we have El Ninos, then we have a raised celebration of the, of the bay anyway. We have a storm that lifts up the water level even more, that the wind blows, we get the waves, the waves over top the levee, we get flooding behind. When the, when the water goes down, we have a lot of damage to the levees. As, uh, as uh, Joe pointed out, there's other impacts we have. There's a plethora of different things that can go wrong on this. And it's pretty, pretty disheartening. So we can have the sea level rising. We can have more uh, coastal erosion. So we build a levee that's bigger to keep the water out. But of course, there's water coming in behind um, 
there's water coming in behind through uh, in increased rainfall or more runoff of the of the land so we have have problems of flooding from the land side trying to get the water back over the levee out into the bay when the bay is coming up so what are we going to do hmm so we did a preliminary study of the Haywood shoreline. If you don't know where the Haywood shoreline, it's in this area here. And as you can see, this is a map, typical map that we have for the, for the bay, which shows the blue areas which are going to get flooded by 2100. So Haywood has its own set of shore, uh, problems. They asked us to do a preliminary study. Preliminary meant 30,000 foot look for $30,000. So <laughs> what, was it, what were the functions that were going to be at risk here? That's what we started off with. Well, Right in the middle of the area is, this, is, is a black area, which is actually 27, 30 foot high above sea level. So it's not going to get inundated. Unfortunately, it's a landfill. And so we don't want to get it eroded. We don't want to get the uh, groundwater interactions. There's a whole sort of management relationships with that landfill that we have to deal with. So we're going to need to protect that area. To the north and south, those red triangles, uh, the water, are the city of Hayward and the Oraloma Sanitary District uh, water treatment facilities. So if they get wet, they get eroded, there's going to be a serious health problems in those areas. They're also, um, between those are uh, large amounts of restored marshes, which, we've, uh, we, we, which we value for the ecological value. So there's a whole series of functions along here which we'd like to maintain, but we would like to see them adapt to sea level change. A lot of the, as, as everywhere, we've got to get the water out of the land um, and into the bay when it comes to, during rainfall. So here we have a typical set of flap gates which are designed very carefully for the specific level of the bay that we have at the moment. As the bay level rises, the flap gates aren't going to work during high tides, so the water's going to back up behind. We're going to have to increase either the detention of the water behind or we're going to have to pump it out. So there's lots of different problems we're going to face with rising sea levels. How are we going to solve those? Another problem we have is that the, not just what's there, um, that the land uses are there, but the, 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 the bay margins serve as conduits for a large amount of our utilities. So there's the ubiquitous PG&E towers you see everywhere on marshes. Uh, we have the Bay Trail, a great facility, a great asset for us, but it's based right out onto the bay. Uh, in this case, we also had a railroad, we have cable, um, we had high pressure gas line, we had aviation fuel lines. And we had the EBDA pipeline. This is a huge uh, pipe, about 10 foot diameter, which runs underneath of the East Bay, which takes all the treated wastewater from all the different wastewater treatment facilities up to Oakland and then puts it out into the bay to be, uh, to be mixed into the bay. But the 70 million gallons a day of treated fresh water travels underground all the way up the bay, and that used to enter into the back of the marshes and make us brackish marshes when we went around and um, nature was, I suppose. So, what do we do? Well, the big, um, the, the, the 80 pound gorilla, 180 pound gorilla in here, is the, uh, some of the transport facilities that Joe talked about. This is the San Mateo Bridge. Uh, this is at the southern end of the area, and what, it, what you can see here is the um, the BCDC map showing very carefully the inundation of the approach to the bridge uh, with sea level rise. And you can see here uh, in this photo, this is the road elevation, this is the uh, visitors uh, um, building for the Hayward shoreline marsh. So th this area here is vulnerable. This is not just a local issue, this is a regional issue, it's part of the regional transportation. What can we do about this? So how does the natural shoreline change. Well, this is a cross-section of the shore. If we didn't have built things here, this is how the bay would respond. Off, off here we have the mud flats, we have a salt marsh, and then we have upland. And what generally happens is that the waves over here resuspend sediment off the mud flat, they take it up into the water column, and that puts that, that sediment then is deposited on the marshes. And the marshes just keep their head just above water. As sea level rises, so the marsh accretes. The waves get big over here, there's more erosion. So there's erosion over here, accretion over here, and everything starts to move upward and landward. If we put a levee in the way, we stop that process. We stop that process, and quite often when you see a levee, you won't find a salt marsh in front of it, because a salt marsh didn't know the levee was there and just carried on going landward and squeezed against the levee, and we basically lost the, lost the mudflat. 
What happens though is the uh, uh, salt marsh, and it, what happens is the mudflat just continues to erode. It doesn't know the levee is there either, and so what we stand to undermine the levee. So as sea level rises, we need to build the, the levee higher to keep the water out. We need bigger rock on it to stop the waves bashing it down. And we need to put the rock lower down, closer down the mudflat, because the mudflat's lowering, we're chasing the toe down. And all the time, our subsided bay land gets lower and lower, and the, the tide gets higher and higher. So if there is a failure, if something does go wrong, and invariably there is, because we, we cannot build levees which just stop everything, then the consequences of those failures increase. So what can we do? Can we make use of the natural shoreline and, it, and the way that it dealt with sea level rise to help us deal with sea level rise in the future? So one thing we can do is call, we can do something called realign. Now, I keep hearing this word retreat. Now, in England, we don't allow that because that would be really <laughs> defeatist. And you hear those Chichilian people saying, we, well, we fought everybody else. We keep the French out and the Germans out. We can't let the, water, the sea in. So we call it realignment. So that's what I'd rather use. And here is what we do is we abandon the Bayshore levee. We say, well, we didn't need to protect all that area or we, we didn't plan to do it, we didn't do that in a logical way, why don't we take down the, the Bayshore levee or allow it to erode and move the levee that we are going to de defend, move it further back to a more logical line, maybe a straighter line, maybe a more, a more a sustainable line. And in between, we can allow the marsh to grow up. And when the marsh waves and the water passes through the marshes and all these waving little bits of vegetation, they take energy out of the waves and the waves get smaller. So you can build a smaller levee at the back, which will last longer and be cheaper. So is that something we can do? Well, unfortunately, we have built on very flat marsh bayland, which is about, a, so about one in a thousand. So if we realign, we gain a bit of time but because the slopes are so low, the water soon comes in, and as soon we have the same problem we had on the outside of the bay, we have it on the inside. So what can we do? Can we maintain the line that we have here, get the benefit of the shoreline here, and still maintain, and, and, but maybe over a shorter distance with a steeper side, but keep the natural system? Well, when we did the Hayward shoreline um, study, we had a great load of stakeholders, and they all had something to bring. They had the, the stormwater people, we had the wastewater treatment people, we had the, the parks people, the city, and so on. So they all brought something to the table. So some of them brought sediment. The sediment from the uh, stormwater channels, that's dredged, now taken out into the bay or, or used on uplands. But couldn't we use that on the shoreline in some creative way? We had the wastewater facility, all that fresh, treated fresh water, which used to go in the back of the marshes, was now being pumped out into Oakland. Could we use that? Uh, then people brought ideas. What about the old style, the, the old form of the, of the shoreline? We, we've lost the, the, the upland ecotone above, or the habitat that was above the tide marshes. We built on top of that. All we now have is very steep levees. Those are other opportunities. The one thing people didn't bring to the table, actually, was uh, money. So, <laughs> but that was no great surprise. But we got a thinking ahead, and it was planning is cheaper than building. So there we go. So we had these opportunities. How could we use those? So this is an idea for a shoreline where we have our, we have our mud flat over here, which we have at the moment. We have our marsh, which we have at the moment. We have our levee, which we build right at the back, and that's guaranteed to keep the water out of the, uh, the, the homes of the good citizens of Hayward. But in between, we've built a, 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 a berm with a long slope, one in 30 slope, much flatter than you would have on a normal levee. And that, uh, that's, that's not an engineered structure. That's just a pile of whatever we have from the stormwater uh, channels and so on and marinas that we build that we allow and we pump the water in behind from the treated wastewater facility we pump that in behind and then we allow the water to seep through now that creates a brackish marsh in the, these upland areas so the water levels down here this is an upland area over here we get bigger plants growing on these brackish marshes they increase their productivity we may even be able to get the the, the upland area to accrete naturally above and keeping up with sea level rise. But what it does give us is, is this long slope along which the tidal marsh can transgress to move landward over time with sea level rise. And so it gives, it gives more space, allows the marsh to do its job within a, in the type of space that we allow it, but also maintains these tidal elevations over here, these safety elevations over here with, the, with this levee. So there's a number of benefits. It provides us with a much better habitat, the one that we've lost in the past and we can now perhaps regain. It provides us with a longer term for the, for the, for the management of the, um, 
for the shoreline to allow, gives us time uh, with sea level rise and also does some waste uh, water quality improvements as well by passing water through this vegetation and denitrifying. So there's a number of be benefits. It's not maybe not the perfect solution, but it's one worth exploring. It might look like something like this. This is something we're looking at in the, for the uh, city of San Jose and their water pollution control plant. This would be the long leve in uh, long transitional zone. This is the this is the channel bringing water, fresh water in behind. This will be over a period of a hundred years or so. The water will gradually build up here, but all the time that we have this backstop of this leve in place. So we're marrying both the uh, flood risk management and the ecosystem re uh, restoration at the same time. And because that's what we used to have in the past, we used to have this continuum of habitats from the mudflat, from the, from the rocket, from the intertidal, through the low marsh, the high marsh, right up into these upland areas. And by recreating that, we're enhancing what we have at the moment and we're preparing for the future. Because we don't know exactly when that future is going to be, we're going to need that uh, protection. There's not, there's those benefits are, are, are very um, beguiling. It, they, 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 they marry up with the ecosystem restorations that have been going around the bay. But there's also a lot of incentives to, um, to, to adapting to the sea level rise. And one of those incentives is, um, is provided by people like insurers and, and investors, those people looking outside at cities and seeing what they're doing. Because we often hear, well, why should we bother about it now? Why don't we put it off to 2020 or 2030, why, why should we be thinking about this now when we've got a lot of other issues, quite re relevant issues, which we need to deal with today? Well, that's because other people are, are looking at adaptation, are looking at what cities are doing, and I like this re report from the, from, this is from uh, Lloyd's insurers who reinsure a lot of people, uh, a lot of uh, organizations, and I like their, their straightforward way of addressing reports. It's called, this one's called Adapt or Bust. And there they say, you know, we're interested, we're going to regularly review their risk appetite, which means we may not come, if, you know, if you're not doing something about adaptation or at least have a plan, then your premiums are either going to go up or we may not even insure you in the, in the future. And so these, there's some hard business decisions to be made which could be alleviated if we start thinking about adaptation and we start incorporating it into our normal planning process. So what would an adaptation strategy look like? Well, this is, this is an attempt to show what might happen. Now, this is not a timeline. I've replaced time with elevation in terms of sea level here. And we have our existing levees. And so for the first sort of six inches or a, a foot of sea level rise, well, that might be OK. But at some point, the sea level is going to get to a certain elevation where our existing levees aren't going to work and we're going to have to do something about it. Now with all capital improvement projects, there's a lead time. So we've got to make a decision before we get to the problem. We've got to get a decision and say, well, you know, this there's a red area here. We're going to have to think about what we're going to do, plan it, do all the environmental documentation, get the permits from BCDC, raise the money, build it, and then have it in place. And it'll work for a period of, period of time, but not it can't accommodate all the sea level rise that people are predicting. It may accommodate, say, a foot or two. And then we're going to have to come to another decision point. And we're going to have to think of something else to do. Maybe it's one of these big, big, long levees, uh, uh, ecotone levees in the place. And that buys us more space, more time. But because it's a bigger project, we're going to have to have a, a longer period of time to think about it. But all this is doing is buying us time. Because you know, remember, right at the beginning of, this, of these set of talks, we talked about sea level rise doesn't stop at 2100. The projections generally do, and coastal conservancy and people don't, think about, don't like to think too much beyond that, that. But all the projections are 2200, 2300, and so on, is the sea level rise continues to go up. Whether the rate changes is that the, the general direction is going up. So we're going to have to make some even bigger decisions. So at some point, when these things get really high, it becomes impractical to hold the, hold the line. We're going to have to think about realigning. And I call it realigning functions. But you know, it's, this is the realignment of, of, of people's homes and places to live where it becomes untenable to keep that, that line right out by the bay. But hopefully that is sometime in the future and hopefully we bought enough time in the, to, to have a, a, a planned realignment rather than a, a rushed retreat. So the next steps. So what do we tell the, the poor people of Hayward about this? Well, we say, well, you know, let's focus on, on 
understanding those vulnerabilities and thresholds, when to think what we're vulnerable to and when will it happen, you know, particularly in what elevations are going to happen. Because we don't know exactly when those, may, when those things may happen. They say 2050, it's going to be 14 inches, 2100, is going to be 55, but they could be out by several decades. And also, you know, what happens if it doesn't pan out like that? What happens if miraculously we, the, the, the physics of the Earth and so on allowed it to, to steady off and we ended up with, with a much lower sea level rise? Let's think about what those win-win situations that we could have where we haven't, don't have regrets, the things we were going to do anyway, we were going to enhance the, the environment, we were going to... Um, look at how we're going to uh, treat our waste water and so on, but incorporate those into in sea level rise adaptation into those long-term capital improvement projects so we didn't spend all our money on something which is out there and we're not, we've got uncertainty about, but provides us with uh, present day benefits and also avoiding doing things that might limit ourselves in the future. And that's where, the, as, as Joe mentioned, adapt, adaptive management is, is really the key. We're going to have to, it's a, I, when we told the, the people in Hayward, well, you know, you're going to have to convene a group and you're going to have to work on a plan and this group's going to stay together for 100 years or so. I mean, it's going to be a long-term thing because you're going to have to keep on working at it. You're going to have to keep monitoring, changing, adapting because we don't know how it's going to be. But that's going to become part of the normal process. And that, so that requires monitoring, and that requires working together, and that was the big thing, and that's what they're working on, getting the different, all the different groups, the cities, the, the uh, East Bay Discharges Authority, the water treatment facilities, they're all signing up memorandums of, uh, of understanding, they're all trying to work together, there's no formal group at the moment, but it's, it's, it's a coalescing of, of, of ideas, because working together is, is not really, uh, working individually is not, is not really going to work, and I, I, I I worried about this last slide, this is the very last slide, because I, I show this one because it's quite funny, but I realise actually somebody in the audience might be in the car, because this is actually a China camp, so just out the road. But this is, um, this is a spring tide in January 2010. Now, this is not, to me, is not a particularly good adaptation strategy that we have here. Um, it's not sustainable. Um, and if we don't start doing things in the, in now, then that may be something that we have to consider in the future. Thank you.